Hi guys, welcome to today's episode of the Inspiring Millennials series. And today I'm really excited because we have blogger and brand strategist Erica Legenza here. So welcome to the show. <laughs> hey Rachel, thanks for having me. Thank you. So Erica is the blogger behind Coming Up Roses, the blog.com. So why don't you tell us how you got started with blogging? Sure. So I started blogging, I started Coming Up Roses um, the sophomore year that I was in college. I have a, I started writing for the college like fashion magazine. Um, And I had done journalism in high school and like wrote for my city paper and everything. So I loved writing, but I hated for the paper I was writing for. I hated the way it was edited because it was, it kind of felt like there was total freedom on the editor's part to change stuff that wasn't necessarily what the editors should be changing. So I got really like, no, like I want to write what I want to write and I don't want to feel so restricted. Um, So that's why I started the blog because I just wanted to be able to write whatever the heck I wanted to write and have this sort of creative outlet that didn't feel restrained. So that was how it started. And it literally was a once a week thing where I was all hyped up on hump day for (laughs) day inspiration. And this was, this was like my jam. And then now it, now I do it three times a week and it is what it is today. That's so cool. I feel like, you know, I recently had a conversation with um, a budding blogger themselves, and I feel like so many people that get started, it's because they feel like that creative outlet is getting doled by either a boss or society or something like that. And so it's like, no, I just need to speak my truth. So I love that. Oh, oh my God. And that's, I mean, that's the beauty in blogging in today's day and age too, because it is such an open platform. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's amazing, you know? Definitely. (laughs) And I love, um, you know, we were talking about this before we actually jumped on the call. Erica recently did a little webinar for a Facebook group that we're in called Bloggers Passion Project. And she talked about just a lot of branding tips and things like that. And you don't necessarily recommend that beginning bloggers have to find this super targeted niche that's like, I'm only going to blog about like pet food treats or something like that. Instead, you kind of recommend building more of a brand. So do you want to kind of elaborate on that? Sure. So what Rachel's referring to is this whole like to niche or not to niche (laughs) controversy that exists in the blogging world. And like we said before, I do brand strategy. So I have kind of, I do not think that you necessarily have to niche your blog to be successful. So this kind of looks like a lot of times people will call themselves a lifestyle blogger. Um, and then kind of use that as an excuse to blog, but some people will use it as an excuse to just kind of use it as a personal diary, say whatever the heck you want to talk about. And that's not necessarily good, but on the flip side, it doesn't mean that you have to restrict yourself to being, I am a food blogger. I am a beauty blogger. I only talk about X, Y, Z that I think the, the key here is to make sure that the direction that you're going in is clear and that the why and kind of like your overarching mission for blogging is something that you are kind of clear about from the start and that extends over whatever you write about. So for me, like when I first started coming up roses, I wasn't saying it was a style blog or a beauty blog or like anything like that. I wanted that creative freedom, but I knew from the start I wanted it to be very inspiring to people and I wanted it to feel like my readers are like my BFFs hanging out at a coffee shop and it's very real, very relatable, very conversational and just kind of like the pick me up you need in the middle of the day, just like if we're hanging out with your best friend at a coffee shop or like over a glass of wine. So it's like, regardless of what category I'm in, I'll try to be like, okay, does this feel like we're literally besties hanging out to having this conversation? And is it like trustworthy? And is it inspiring in some way to like actually take action and be useful and helpful. That's kind of like a little hack to when you don't want to be niche and feel limited categorically, but you still want to be focused and still be able to brand your blog in some way so that you're still known for something in what you're doing. Absolutely. And I think also, you know, one of the common emails I get a lot of the time as a business coach is I don't know how to find my brand's voice or they start a blog and they're like, I hate it. It's just, I'm, it's not me. I don't know what's wrong with it. And so I kind of think like writing that kind of mission statement, something I talk about, something you talk about is one of those things that is going to help guide you and filter out so much of the advice and BS online. Because if you're reading a ton of other people's content, like you're going to to feel overwhelmed in figuring out what fits for you and probably end up in this kind of like perfection paralysis where you're not taking any action. Yeah. So I love that. Um, it's something I, I also, you know, found true with the confused millennial. It was kind of like I'm a lifestyle blog, 
do I blog about recipes? Do I blog about this category? What, like, what category do I blog about? Like, I don't want to confuse people, but that at the end of the day, it was kind of about finding that mission statement and having a place for other confused millennials to go, be sarcastic, but also be really honest and truthful um, while providing just like general life advice. And so I love that kind of niche by category if, or niche by mission statement, if you will. Okay. Um, so that's awesome. So, okay. You started off writing pretty much in college and then after college, did you go into like the corporate world at all or did you go full tilt on your blog? Nope, I went full time on the blog from the, really? time. I had cool. done, I had like five internships throughout the course of college. So, and I very much from the start was like, okay, this whole internship thing, I have to, I want it to be like literally weeding out career options. So I would go into something and be like, all right, what am I doing? And can I do this for the rest of my life? And it was very much, it was very quickly turned into no, 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 like couldn't do it. I interned corporate, I interned like agency side. So it was essentially like picking out the positives from every internship experience and being like, all right, what can I take away from this that I do like on an experiential basis and on kind of like a day-to-day task basis? And then how can I craft my ideal career accordingly? So it ended up being like corporate. I hated the pace of it. I hated the corporate ladder. I hated asking permission for everything because I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. Um, I hated having to like prove myself to people who had very much that, uh, had a very stagnant or fixed mindset. But then I went agency side and I loved the brand strategy work I was doing at an agency. And I loved the, the faster paced feel of consulting work and but there were still loops to jump through. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to combine everything that I've done with all of that and turn it into my brand strategy coaching business and the work I'll do for marketing and brand for businesses. And then I'm continuing the blog and I'm doing full-time blogging because that's where I feel most fulfilled. And if I can make the income from that, then hell yeah, that's what I'm doing. And there we go. (laughs) Wow. I just kind of got goosebumps because like, I didn't realize our stories were so similar. And when I decided to start my coaching business, it was kind of sitting down and saying like, I don't like how closed minded this is. I don't like the pace this is. I don't like a lot of things that I'm seeing in this like corporate lifestyle. And let me sit down and write about what my skills are, what the dream aspects are, like what's really working with me and fueling my personality and my life's mission and and see how I can turn this into a reality for myself. So that's so cool. (laughs) Um, That's awesome. So would you say that because I know a lot of bloggers probably watching this are probably trying to figure out how to monetize their blogs. At what point did you start generating revenue from your blog? I think I started generating revenue early on. It was more so to what degree of Mm -hmm. revenue it was. um, Because, like, you always get emails from people that want free promotion or cheapo promotion. Mm -hmm. And more so is, I think, the turning point where you're able to actually turn it into a full-time thing is when... A, you're doing the work and like your content and numbers speak for itself, but B, you respect yourself and you respect your worth and you are determined that you will not settle for opportunities that are trying to take advantage of bloggers and don't understand the value of influencer marketing. So it's like when you make that shift from being a blogger to being an influencer and then you capitalize on that and you reinforce the fact that you're not just someone with writing your personal thoughts down, but that you do have an audience that trusts you and respects you and wants your opinion and will make purchasing decisions based off of your what you say. That's where the, the tide kind of shifts and you're able to monetize a lot more because you're now now you're a marketing tool for them. And now you are when you capitalize on that instead of just yeah, I'll write a review. People might read it. People might like it. Who knows? But when you capitalize on like, no, this is who is reading my blog. This is your audience. Like you need my voice to speak more effectively to them. Now it's a game changer. And like, now you're seen differently. You can ask for more pay. You can monetize more because now you're an effective marketing tool for them. And you're not just free PR. There, you just said so many different things. So I want to kind of go back and unpack some of that stuff because sure. there's just so much value right there. I actually just had this conversation with another blogger and so many times, so often we as bloggers get two main requests. One, which is, will you write about my ex for free on your blog? And two, other blogs, <laughs> that's how I feel too. Um, and two, other blogs that are just starting out that want you to guest post for them or write for free for them. And so I have a big issue when other blogs approach me and say, hey, will you write original content for my blog for free? I'm like, no, I, 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 I'm not writing original content unless it's paid. Um, but if you want to take a syndicated post and post that I've already written and repost it on your site, 
with my copyright byline and my bio and my headshot, that's okay. And, and so for me, in my opinion, I don't know if you agree or disagree with this, we're not doing necessarily a service of asking our peers to write for us for free because we're really ultimately lowering, lowering our ability to get paid and do freelance writing gigs, ultimately. Would you kind of agree with that? Like, what do you... I think people, I think all the time, we're almost trained as an industry to think less of ourselves and less of our worth. And everyone in, in this hustle mentality is trained to think like, not there yet, not good enough yet. I still need to like hustle and like, r like pull at the side of the cliff to, for opportunities and to like try to make it. And it ends up holding us back because not asking for more. We end up not respecting our own worth. We end up not respecting other people's worth, which spirals all the way to brands don't respect our worth. Definitely. So if everyone comes across like, I'm just trying to make it like any, someone promote me, someone put me somewhere. Brands take notice of that. And they like, hmm, she just wants to get noticed more followers than her. So this will be great. Like she'll work for free. No problem. Because she just wants to get noticed. Like, honey, no, like there are plenty of strategies out there to help you get noticed. And when you are working hard and you're being consistent and you're building your brand and you're doing the work, you will get noticed. Mm -hmm. The whole point is that. You also need to, if you're trying to make it a living, you're not going to go from making nothing to making a full-time income. Mm -hmm. You have to be respecting your worth all the way throughout your period of growth and like not be afraid to say no to big brands who are just trying to take advantage of you to get as much free press as they can. Totally. And actually, you did the perfect segue right there because if we're doing writing for free for our peers, then we're going to ultimately be expected to do it for free with the bigger brands that actually have a budget. Yeah. Um, and, and so it all really starts with those little shifts early on. And there's tons of ways to collaborate with bloggers. That way you guys are both getting mutually beneficial stuff. Um, but really asking somebody to write an original piece for you, it, it's one of those things that just like breaks my heart a little bit. And I think... Um, and you have to think about too, like how can you bring value to them? Like it has to be mutually beneficial value. So it'll be, it's a whole different ballpark. If someone reaches out to me with this idea and they also, they, if they acknowledge the fact that like I have a bigger following than them, however, they think they can benefit me in this way. That's so much more, that's like so much more attractive because it's not like I'm trying to be like, oh no, I'm better than you. Like absolutely not. But it's a matter of if I only have 24 hours in a day and I have my own blog and my own business that I'm growing and I respect my own business. It has to, it's a business. Like there has to be some value added in some way. Otherwise, why is it worth my time? It's like, it's not like any of us are sitting around twiddling our thumbs. Like, hmm, when's the next opportunity? <laughs> so like, I can't wait to just work for work for free. Like, no, dude, there's Netflix. There are so many hobbies that I would rather do that don't require me working. Like I could just lay down and literally I could just lay down and rest. And like, why, why should I work for free? Definitely. <laughs> and you actually kind of brushed over something that's really important. The pitch email, whether it's you're pitching bigger brands or you're pitching peers in the blogging community, being really specific about what your value add is, is crucial because there's only 24 hours in a day. And I mean, I'm sure you get this too. I'll get 10 emails in one day sometimes from people wanting to partner up and things like that. And I'm like, okay, but now you're, I'm having to go and spend 30 minutes tracking down <laughs> all of your social media stats and Alexa ranking and everything to figure out if this is a, a, t a time investment worth making for me. It's not that yeah. I don't want to support you. It's not that I don't want you to grow with me, but it's about, I can't get my time back. Absolutely. And that's like, and that's, that's like the biggest thing, like what you just said, regardless of what type of pitch it is, you need to be clear on your value add. And you have to think of it through the eyes of who you're sending it to, because they're going to be reading it and they're going to be thinking, what's in this for me? That's just how we are subconsciously as human beings. There's always, whether it's you're watching a commercial, whether it's you're like walking in a store, whether it's an email, you're always going to be thinking, well, what do I get out of this? So that's the same reason when bloggers get emails that are kind of sketchy from companies and they read it and they're like, wait, what? Like, what do you even want me to do? It's a waste of time. So literally just be clear upfront about what you want and be clear about what value you bring to the table too, because you're so much more likely to be taken seriously if you're just honest and upfront about it, because Otherwise, you're wasting people's time and they're going to be a little pissed off to begin with when they respond if, if they feel like they've just been like, oh, wasting my time. Exactly. Also, with that said, it, brands or bloggers, I think a lot of times will wonder like, well, why didn't you email me back? I'll actually like not respond to somebody via email and I'll get like an Instagram comment sometimes. Well, I sent you something. Why didn't you respond to me? It's like, well, because I had no idea what you were asking for. 
of my time. And yeah. It's like, if you get so many emails, sometimes you get, you, like, if you're building it to be a business, you might not, you literally don't have enough hours in a day to get through an inbox if you're doing this as a business. And if you're just doing it yourself and don't have someone else going through your emails, even if you do, like, a lot of times you tell people, these are my standards. And if they are clearly not, like, respectable of that, like, no, why, you know, like, if you don't put in the time to put in that little extra ounce of effort, to show me what you even want in the first place? Why should I put in the extra effort to help you for free, like, and go above and beyond for you? You can't go above and beyond in writing an email. Why should I go above and beyond in doing all of this work and helping you and like whatever else is invested and not get anything out of it for myself? You know, it's a work ethic too. Definitely. So if you're going to pitch somebody, whether you are a brand or a blogger, what is your value add? Clearly stating what you are asking. And, and if somebody would have to go back through that and research more about you, anything like that, see how you could get your point across as clearly and concisely as possible. So they'll actually want to respond to you. Love yeah. it. And done your research too on top of that. Sorry, that's, part, that's like in part of adding value too. Is you cannot just seem like you are emailing every single email, every single person in a network, that is the quickest way to get deleted. Use my name and show me that you've actually done your research and say the value add. So like, if you come to me and you're like, this is why we should partner up and this is the value I bring to the table, I will listen to you. If you're like, hello, ma'am, or like, hello, owner of Coming Up Roses. I'm like, dude, my name is on my homepage. Did you not look? <laughs> It's true. I kind of want to go back and unpack one of the statements you said, which was you kind of make a shift to being an influencer. And everyone has kind of a different definition of when that shift happens. And I think what you said earlier is really important where as bloggers or online entrepreneurs, we feel like we're not good enough yet. We're not there yet. We don't know what our value add even is yet. At what point did you start to realize like you had what were the numbers that you started to realize that like, you're an influencer? Did you look at percent engagement? Did you look at number of site visits? Like what were those types of numbers and how did, how do you evaluate that? I don't look at numbers for determining whether or not you're an influencer mm -hmm. because people can buy numbers mm -hmm. and be in comment for comment or follow for follow threads that impact your numbers mm -hmm. and literally means diddly squat as to whether or not you are a good blogger, let alone influencer. What I look at is, what people say to me. And if I like, I start taking notice when I'm on Snapchat and I snap something and someone snaps me back and is like, what desk do you have? I love it. And I want it. And I, you know, or if I'm reading a book and someone tweets me or, and they're like, I just bought that book because I saw you recommend it. And it looks really good. I'm like, that's influence because people are, people are that engaged and trust you that much mm -hmm. where you can literally hold something up and be like this pen you need this pen in your life and people will be like, send me the link. <laughs> like I need this pen, mm -hmm. you know, like, that is influence. And that can happen whether you have a hundred followers or a hundred thousand followers, mm -hmm. you have a hundred followers, but you can convince every single one of those hundred followers to buy something or to take action of some sort mm -hmm. because they trust you that much and are that loyal to you and your brand. That's influence like point blank period. And if you have a hundred thousand people and only a hundred of them are interested, that's not as good as having a hundred percent out of your a hundred followers be interested and be influenced by what you have to say. Definitely. So it's not a numbers game. I don't think, I think it literally comes down to the level of trust and the relationship that you build with your following. Definitely. I completely agree with that. All of the points with that. But with that said, also, if you are going to approach larger brands to partner with you, they don't necessarily understand all those minutia details like that you were saying about bot followers or exchanges and things like that. So kind of at what point should we have the confidence to reach out to bigger brands and saying like, hey, this is what I'm doing. Like what would, how would I pitch that value add to somebody? You have to be even more explicit about the value add that you bring to the table. So those are the projects where you have to go above and beyond in your pitch to really like really go above and beyond. Mm -hmm. So for example, I think a thousand followers is like the absolute minimum to start working with brands, regardless of the size of the brand. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a hundred followers, even if they all buy, there's a good chance that a lot of them are like your mom, your sister, your family, your friends. Like that was me. I'm like, my mom's my number one, number one reader, number one fan. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have to show that you have a true community starting and it's not just your personal, it's not just like your personal network that happens to be following your branded stuff. 
if that makes sense. Then when I say it comes down to the value add, I say that because there's been times where I've pitched brands and their response to me was normally we work with followers, people who have followers of like 150,000 on Instagram alone plus. And I'm sitting there like, I got 14,000 on Instagram. I'm not close to 150,000 yet. But they said, however, because of the pitch, we are willing to, we're willing to talk with you. Mm -hmm. So it comes down to being so clear about this is why I can bring value to you. And it has to be true and it has to be compelling. So with that, it really, then it, it depends on, you have to show that it's actually a good, sensical brand partnership from a, their marketing perspective. So it can't just be like, I love your brand. They're, they could be like, yeah, so does so many other people. Like, okay, that doesn't help us. You have to be able to then go a, a step further and say like, this is the demographics of who reads my blog. This is like what they're interested in. And here's what proves that they're interested in this. This is how engaged they are. And that's where you prove the influence you have. So if you can say with every single snap story, like at least three people screenshot it, at least two people reach out to me and say, where can I buy this? At least like if I post an affiliate link, at least eight people click through and purchase, you know, like that's where you support it with numbers to prove that what you're saying is true. You just have to prove the right things because at that point it's like, well, I had this many followers, doesn't matter. Then that's where they're going to want to know if you have less followers than the threshold we typically look at, how engaged are they and why are they the right followers for us to be targeting? Because that's what the game is. It's not just like you have followers, congratulations. It's why are your followers the people that we should be engaging with and putting our brand in front of? Mm -hmm. so that's kind of like the marketing brand like brain behind all of that as to like how you should be thinking of it definitely and that's you know that's kind of exactly where I was going with the question is the numbers aren't about followers they're about that percent engagement they're about that demographic those are all if you don't have google analytics set up for your business or blog right like you need to go do that right now because the app will show your demographics like are they female are they male or what age group are they you really really need to get clear on those things if you're going to try to work with brands because especially right now like we're all in our 20s and brands are perplexed by the millennial generation they have no idea how to get loyalty from millennials they have no idea how to get us to buy from them and keep buying from them um, I know millennial bloggers is like the ultimate trend right now that I see happening being one of them myself. Um, but if you can actually speak to that and like what value add you're going to bring, especially to that market that nobody seems to be cracking the code on, that's going to be worth a lot to people. Yeah, and if you think about it in terms of, instead of thinking it in terms of numbers, if you think about it in terms of if all of my people are sitting in an auditorium together or sitting in a room together, how do we summarize the crowd? You know, it's like, you can't just be like, I think some of them like this. And I think some of them like this. It's like, no, if you're sitting in a big giant auditorium and the brand walks on stage, they want to know what the crowd is going to think about them. And they want to know that the crowd is receptive to what they are offering. Otherwise, it's just going to be embarrassing and awkward and not make any sense. And to tie that all the way back to like the very start of our conversation, mm -hmm. it's not just about what your niche category is. It's about whatever the mission is behind what you're doing as a blogger, as an online business, anything like that. Um, and that's actually a great little exercise for people listening to this to kind of go through if they're struggling with that clarity of their lifestyle blog or something like that. I love that. Yeah. And I mean, that's how you, you have to think about it. It's like, if you are niche, that's totally fine. It's mm -hmm. much specific. But if you are a very specific food blogger and your audience is full of 15,000 people who also like food, that's also not the only thing they like. Yes. Like they are more complex people than that. So you can be very niche for the purpose of attracting very specific interests that are very, very niche and focused and narrow. And you'll have great engagement and great, you know, like great page views from that probably. However, it's like if you can kind of take it up that one step and still give them something that's valuable to them as people, why not? Definitely. Love that. Okay. So you have your online blog, then you also have your strategist and coaching business. Um, is that housed on your blog or is there a separate website for that? Yes and no. So I'm going to create a separate website. I have some options like through my blog where you could get in on that. But um, right now it's separate. And because predominantly it's like, I like, I create stuff for companies. So it's not necessarily something that individuals even need, but I do have stuff for solopreneurs that I do as well. And then I do a lot of that through social media and through Facebook and will eventually have a separate website 
fully for it most likely just not yet um, like what percentage would you say comes from of your revenue comes from the blog versus uh brand strategy most of it's from the blog but that's because i just started the brand strategy stuff in a month ago um <laughs> so like officially doing it there's so many different ways to monetize your blog so would you say that stuff comes from primarily affiliates um are those affiliates with brands or other kind of like selling other people's courses and stuff like that most of my income is sponsored content and then what would you say like is the second and third revenue stream with the blog sponsored content is definitely that's it by like a long shot below that would probably be like people who want to do like one-on-one -on -one consultations with me and like get help on their own blog and then affiliates is like down below that I don't do a lot with affiliate stuff directly because quite frankly I don't think people I don't think companies pay enough to be an affiliate for the company I think like and there's been so many times like I use like to know it and everything and it's like if I can convince someone to buy something and I get literally five cents from that purchase that's ridiculous like I don't so a lot of times that's why I work primarily in the sponsored content space because I prefer creating long lasting ambassadorships with companies where I'm essentially an affiliate for the company, but I'm being fairly compensated for it and can like really go all out for them. And I think that's kind of more true influence. Whereas I don't like, I don't know, a lot of times just affiliates just don't, it's just don't do it for me. It's a lot of work, especially if you're working, because I know you do a lot with like beauty products and fashion and things like that. It's a lot of work to set, pull the affiliate links and, and uh, you know, it, it put together it's so much work because then you have to create the perfect instagram you have to get yep. all of it on to your blog you have to write all these things you have to put like 16 different little links which takes forever to pull those they really need to have a better system it's just not worth the time it's investment much. and i'm like if i'm gonna make a dollar from this you gotta like there are way better ways i can walk down the street and find a dollar on the street and that would be so much easier like <laughs> No, ain't nobody got time for that. I just, I, I, foc I try to focus on what's going to make me the most money and be the most valuable for everyone. So if I'm going to be pr be promoting something, mm -hmm. any, I'd rather it be a long lasting relationship that's actually with a company and not just like an affiliate, a random affiliate link somewhere. Definitely. I love that. We're getting closer to the end here. What would you say? I know we talked about so much advice and things like that. <laughs> What would you say kind of your advice is for the multi-passionate millennial, whether they're trying to get started blogging or just graduating from college, you know? Follow all of the passions. <laughs> I love that. My mom and I were just talking about it the other day. Parents parented me very differently because they were never like, you have to choose one thing. They were like, all right, uh, can you ask us before you sign us up to be like the chaperones at everything? But otherwise, like if you want to sign up for everything, do it. And I did. And then it was a natural process of weeding out what's for me, what's not for me. And then I think I figured out what I wanted to do with my life a lot quicker than a lot of my peers who are still like, oh shoot, now I have no idea. But it's because I was very much like, I'm going to try everything all at once and I'll figure out very quickly what I like and what I don't like. And then I'll narrow from there. So I don't think you have to choose your like one passion over another. I think pursue as many as you reasonably can to have it make sense. And then don't be afraid to then say, Nope, I tried it, but it wasn't for me. And then next it. Love that. It's so true. I think, you know, because especially right now, like millennials are constantly get written up in the media for constantly job hopping, not having loyalty, all these different things. But I think it's because like a lot of us feel like we should be on this one path and we're realizing that we hate it. So take, say yes to every opportunity, take, do five internships like you did, try all these different things, explore those passions and figure out what's going to fit for you and what's not going to fit for you. Because yeah, I think the idea of being in one career that we don't absolutely love for the rest of our lives definitely feels like we're being buried alive. <laughs> um, so who wants to do that? He is just to do it intentionally and to do it critically. The key is to not just hop around for the sake of hopping around being like, I wonder when my purpose will hit me in the face. Like it's not going to, you have to find it yourself actionably. So the key is to be very intentional going into every opportunity thinking, okay, what do I like from this? What do I not like from this? How do I feel about it when it's done? Yes, no, yes, like to what part? And then reassess, reanalyze and like move forward with that in mind. Don't just like hop around for the sake of hopping around. It's like, but if you do it with intention, you're setting yourself up to be just fine. <laughs> I love that. Is there anything else that you kind of wanted to add before we wrap things up? Oh, gosh, I don't. 
I don't think so. I, <laughs> I think it's awesome. Everything that you're doing with this interview series, I feel like it's just oh, so valuable to people. And I wish that more people could see it. Thank you. Plenty of all could like see this and abide by it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so where can people connect with you after this? Where, like what primary social media platforms are you typically on? Oh my God, I'm on everything. But if <laughs> you have like a specific question for me, you can tweet me. That'd be cool. Mm-hmm. You can send me an email anytime, which is on you can there's a contact form on my blog homepage. I love Instagram, so you can <laughs> talk to me on Instagram too. That's fine. And literally you could Snapchat me and I'll snap you back with like a video off my face. That is just like you're hanging out. Awesome. And I'll include all of the links to those in the blog post for this. And then the blog again is coming up roses the blog.com. And thank you so much again, Erica, for making the time and just being super awesome with all the advice you gave. Of course. Thank you for having me. This is so much fun. <laughs>